Okay. It's interesting to think about when we left Central and we started this, when we first started, we wanted, well, when we first started, we were just going to do the one class. Um, let me pull out of here real quick. We just were going to do one presentation a week, but in my mind, I was like, I know that's not going to get us through till, you know, by November 9th with 46 classes in 46 weeks. But think about the irony, is that the way the word? <laughs> that we're on the study of revolutions the last couple of weeks today and then next week, and it's the revolutions, there are other places, but it's the revolutions that, that 
much mark November 9. It was other things that marked 2019 that also marked November 9, but the revolution seemed to mark them the most. Uh, maybe somebody has better understanding, but the revolutions really seem to show November 9 um, clearly. So it can't be an accident that we're here <laughs> looking at these particular studies of all the ones that all the classes that have been, you know what I mean, at this particular time. So praise the Lord for he knows how to orchestrate everything. So this is um, continuing from where we left off last week. Now revolutions part three, and then there's one more part to this. And um, I just wanted to say too that we were discussing last week, we're going to continue during the Monday, Wednesday, Friday studies, doing current thing, current studies. And we're going to go on to the Australia ones as soon as they're posted um, or do the Australia ones that already are posted and then um, go on to the new camp meeting that they're doing that starts actually today's the second right so they're probably already starting today because they're oh, yeah. they're close to like 24 hours ahead of us they're on the third already. yeah wow. so so um, I'll make a schedule tomorrow morning with the admin Australia ones and post it and whoever if anyone has the first one, because they're longer. So we're gonna do one presentation a night. They're not translated, so they're full length, um, if that's all right. So yeah. we'll have enough for this week, at least. Yeah. And we'll go through them, uh, Tess and Parminder, because they've been working in tandem, supporting each other's presentations. Yeah. Did they start the camping meeting? It we're starts, just talking about that. It, it, they start, they start on the third, and it's the third <laughs> for them already. <laughs> I can't believe you got a jacket here. <laughs> so, uh, so in in another in the, on another note, because I keep remembering this after we're in song, because I'm pretty sure the sequence is supposed to be announcements and then song, but because um, I keep remembering this and I don't want to forget it, so I'm going to say now for November nine next week, um, we're doing our mini camp meeting again here. Make sure he knows here. <laughs> so he knows here. <laughs> so, um, but Sister Adriana, Sister Tony, and the Flukas family, Brother Lamar, and then the children are doing presentations. If you guys would each email, Adriana's right here so she can um, email both of her and I the notes, and maybe she will be better able to have time to go get them printed if there's so many pages that you don't want to print them off your printer, um, or send them to me, and I'll send them off to Staples to have them printed. We only need to print it for our group right here. They can get the online, they'll have to get them online, but just so that we, but if you have the notes to us so that we can have them prepared to email, or so that we can have time to print for our, for us here next week, but then also so that I can be able to send them out on Friday. Yeah, I don't, I need prayer because I don't know what to present on coming up because I did that on the just camp meeting. Well, praise the Lord, you're fast at putting stuff together. <laughs> um, I would like to ask for prayer because the other night I was probably five minutes from the rest of the sentence, but I had stayed up late that night because I was really kind of into it. Um, I wake up the next morning and I only had three paragraphs out of 10 pages. So oh. uh, it kind of put me like in a, a weird state. I'm trying to get out of it, you know, you know, this devil's after me right now. So um, just keep me in prayer because I decided to do a different one anyway, and that's going to take me a while, but I will have it for you. Okay. If we need to divide it up a little bit more, we can do that too. Um, well, I was thinking about doing the one that um, Parminder came up. It's the three-hour one about the um, 2012. Oh wow, that's a two. Yeah, hour. I thought I'd do that. Yeah, that's a long one. Yeah, that's a two-hour. It's hour. a long one. So you may have to divide it, but I don't know. But at least we could get some of it out of there. But I just thought it would be important. You know what? It was kind of divided. They just filmed it all at one because okay. if you noticed if you went through it, they go pause and they go have lunch or something, and then they come back. And okay. so, but the but the video just kept going straight through. So maybe you can find those breaks. And uh, okay. it was like they just filmed instead of stopping the film, they just recorded it all in one big thing. But it was both it was different ones. So it's all okay. put together in one video. Is this yeah, for Monday night? That's what she she's talking about for November nine, next week. Oh, 
I think that's pretty cool if you did do that, Sister Tony. That's my ambition. Pray for me, please. Okay, we'll be praying for all you guys, and uh, that we get it that we get it together. I think I'll still continue to work on my number four one, even though we'll probably do it the following week. So, okay, so Revolutions three, and nice. it was really good last night to review 2019. Um, I did have a couple of points that I picked up this morning while continuing to listen to several presentations on on there. Let me find my little picture that I took. Uh, 2004, that came up. We were talking about what it was 2004, right? Yeah. And somebody mentioned the Beslan School. I think Sister Susan did that. No, that was me. Oh, that was you. Okay. The foundation, Foundations of the Truth in Ozone. Also, and I forgot about this one, that it was 2004. The restraint was put on the executive branch by Comey and Mueller. That was when Ashcroft was in the hospital. Anybody remember that one? When Ashcroft was in the hospital? Yeah. Okay. So... That's Go ahead. That was 2004, did you say that? 2004, yeah. The little was recording that? shows that we're recording, right? Everybody's, yeah. Yeah. It's you mean the uh, restraint on the Patriot Act? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, when, but when, Omi and James Cohen. was in the right? hospital and they wanted to sign, maybe somebody better oh, yeah, remembers the details, that. but they wanted they wanted him to sign. Bush is wanting him to, ch was it Cheney? Who else was it? Not Cheney. James Comey. Yeah, yeah, James Comey and Mueller. James Comey was on his way there because he was the acting attorney general while Ashcroft was in the hospital. Comey then called um, Mueller. They didn't know each other well, if I remember right, but he knew that he was going to need backup and support because he's got the two that were in the office, and I, in the hospital, and I can't remember their names, if somebody remembers them, but they were in there trying to get Ashcroft to sign this it was it an extension on the Patriot Act? Did you Patriot expand Act. it? And uh, and they knew it was violating the Constitution. So Comey calls Mueller because he knew he was going to need support because he knew that they were going to try to kick him out of the hospital. So having a witness there. So that was also 2004. So that would be external. Did I? Was there somebody else that was going to say something? Can you see? Okay, so then the other thing that I was looking at, um, in going back to the pirate, pirate victory, because you have, and I was looking up the, um, St the Stalin's, uh, the midnight speech, um, and Sister Christine was, was right, and I think others had seen that too. It wasn't a November 9, it was a February something. February 25th. Yeah, and, but when he, February something, yeah, Sorry, 20, 20 something, 20, 20 something. And so when he did that, and maybe somebody can help me if I have this um, correct, but I, I need to better understand what went on in Russia my own self because I have a really hard time at grasping these things. But <clears throat> when he did that, it made changes, revolutionary changes around the world. But he wasn't exactly liked by those that supported Stalin, if I understood correctly, right? So eventually it did do damage, I think is what, what she was pointing out. I can't remember the exact word she used, but, um, and then she went in and talked about the pirate victory. So when, so in the pirate victory, we know that the pirate victory is when um, Pyrus, Pyrus has a victory, but it costs him his own, his cost him his own self. So when Putin is going to, and she was almost but saying this, if I understood correctly, it was in France the, the, when she left Arkansas last year, the, the 2018 classes, that um, Putin, when he's going to reveal secrets on Trump, it's actually going to expose him as well for what he's been doing. So it's going to cost him what he does. So then going back to what is he going to expose, there's a lot of thoughts to that. But what we've put up there... I don't think we had this part on the, we had 9-11 to 2019. Um, but when you have November 9, 2019, and you back up three years, you have November 9, 2016, which, the elect, which is the election, right? What happens when you back up another three years, November 9, 2013, where was Trump? Russia. In Russia. At the beauty pageant. So just a few extra things that, that were picked up on that. 
So November 9 is, was being pointed to, and from what she says in our previous studies, that November 9 was pointed, to, pointed out over and over again by the secular world. Not within the movement, but it was the secular world that was, that was pointing all these things out. <coughs> so um, we're going to look back at a little bit at the pre previous study real quick before we go on to revolutions here. We started looking at 2014 and the phrase, in God we trust. Um, and I just want to, not that I always have typos, but there's probably going to be more in this one than usual. So, because um, I didn't get back and get it reviewed one last time. So we're looking at 2014 and the phrase, in God we trust. We went from 2014 to 1863. We knew that was connected by the 151. In 1863, they chose the phrase, in God we trust. They also form the National Reform Movement, and it's the formation of, of the, in our, in the National Reform Movement as it tries to introduce Sunday laws, the first one in 1863, and that causes A.T. Jones and other pioneers to begin the publishing of the American Sentinel. They began issuing the American Sentinel in, 19, in 1886, and they're trying to counteract the work of the National Reform Movement. So there's some description in there if you need it of how to find the American Sentinel. We don't need to go through all that, but <clears throat> for anybody that does need it, it's there in the, on the CD-ROM, just go under Pioneers, A.T. Jones, and uh, find the American Sentinel. So um, when you open up those years, you can open up the American Sentinel number nine, and it will take you to the 1894, and you'll find it there listed by weeks to take you to the particular week's articles. This, there's only one mention of In God We Trust. She's talking about in the American Sentinel in these, these documents um, or these articles. The history that he is giving is 1894, and it's in the March 15th, 1894 edition. And there's a hearing by the House of Representatives in Congress. So it's 1894, and there's a debate going on in the House of Representatives in Congress or a hearing. They're just they're discussing whether or not to amend the Constitution and establish the Christian religion as the official religion of the United States. Their excuse for wanting to recognize it is the steps that have already been taken. One of those excuses they make in 1894 by Congress is that we've already taken the phrase, in God we trust, and stamped it on our coins. And we know we've heard that said before as well. They're saying it, they said it in 2001 as well after 9-11 when it comes to putting church in the, or God in the schools and in government buildings. It actually becomes part of their excuse or reasoning why Protestantism should be the official religion of the United States. It says that considering in God we trust is on our coins and a couple of other steps that have recently been taken, why shouldn't they also recognize it within the Constitution? because the Constitution is deficient and hasn't kept up with the other steps. The step they want to take is recognizing the name of God. It's interesting that this is the ninth year of operation of the American, the, the American Sentinel. The American Sentinel, the ninth year of operation in the 11th week. So in looking for the reference, it's AMS 911. This placing of the inscription on the coins becomes an excuse to amend the Constitution in 1894. We need to highlight that mentioning of the phrase and encourage us all to go and read some of those articles to get some of the idea of the history and what A.T. Jones was fighting for. So we know that in 1863, they placed it, they came up with the phrase, in God we trust, the National Reform Movement is formed. 1886, the American Sentinel um, begins publication. They begin publicize, pub, is that the word? Pub, the publication of the American Sentinel, and it's in opposition to fight against the National Reform Movement. So go to the 1894 articles, and you'll find article um, in the ninth uh, year of operation in the 11th um, oh, no. week, 9/11. So we looked at our histories of revolutions. And we recognize that we weren't taking the French Revolution history and moving it literally, did I say that word right, to 2014, because that would be marking some type of progression. What we've needed to do was cut the line and take it underneath our history. 
the French Revolution and the American Civil War using the concept of a midpoint where we are able to overlay both these histories from 9-11 to 2019. So I don't have that <clears throat> on this particular slide, but if we remember it, that it was one big long line of progression, but you can cut the French Revolution history out, the Civil War history cut out, and you can lay it, lay it underneath, overlay it underneath the 9-11 um, to 2019 and showing that you would have 9-11 here, 9-11 here, and you'd have 2014, and you'd have 2019. 2019 showed you, um, I'm sorry, um, yeah, 2019 showed you the rise of Napoleon, the death of Abraham, so you have the death of a dictator, the rise of a dictator, and also took us down to this German Revolution, which we'll talk about. The German Revolution doesn't have a midpoint? No, not that it's shown on here. Right. There are some other more other things that come on here, but I don't rec I don't know I don't recall it having a midpoint. Um, they show these ones show the midpoint where this one shows the counter revolution, but you can also see a counter revolution that happens here. Were you going to say something? It's only ten days from October thirty to yeah. November nine. Yeah. So we talked about the German Revolution, eleven days that led up to Kaiser's abdication on November 9. And if we remember right, this was where the soldiers, or the, the Navy uh, sailors mutinied because they were gonna send them out to, to go out in a blaze of glory where they would um, sink all their ships and it was gonna be a suicide mission. And so they mutinied against the government. So, and also the placement of a new government, there's a period of preparation here and that's where the Spartacists were here. There was this uh, Frank, Frederick Ebert, takes over, but the Spartacists challenge him. Um, and there's this period of preparation before the counter-revolution. And what this is, if I'm understanding correctly, and I'm still trying to learn some of this, of, of what our counter-revolution looks like <clears throat> in our time. But what this is telling us is after November 9, there's this period of preparation before in the next year, the counter-revolution begins. So there's this period of preparation before a rival faction challenges that new government. What we have is a revolution and then a counter-revolution. The thread that we are tying together to recognizing November 9, and we're going to follow that through history. We talked about the significance of November 9 in German history, and we haven't actually looked at those dates yet. We've just mentioned them because we do have some pre-knowledge of them. But less familiar is 1848. We read an article from Time Magazine that talked about November 9, 1918, the end of that revolution. This is a historian who compares this revolution with 2016 and the election of Donald Trump. And two days later, we have the armistice. There's one other sentence we want to highlight in that magazine article, and that is when they say that prior to this revolution, Germany had been engulfed in a costly war that had seemed endless. What this article says is the United States has been suffering in a similar way. With the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, these proxy wars that the people are tired of. He says they've had 16 years of also fighting wars that the people are tired of, and we've come to a point that is an end and a beginning with the election of Donald Trump. So the 1848 one we talked about last week with the death of Robert Blum, marking not the end of a revolution, but a turning point in the revolution. And 1848 was two years before 1850, which would have been the loud cry. We would mark that loud cry as uh, 2019, 2018, 2018. So two years before 2018, you've got 2016, which is the election. So this 1848 in this revolution here, the earliest November 9 date, Robert Blum was, and I thought it was, I don't know if this means anything, but he was born on November 10th. I don't remember the year, but he was born on November 10th. And then he dies on November 9th of 1848. So they took the history of 1918 and they want to make it 2016. But we're not making it 2016, we're making it 2019. Why is it not 2016? We see the death of a dictator in 2016, 
market it as this 1848, if I'm following what she's saying here. We see this death, and I don't know, Robert Blum, he wasn't a dictator, was he? Because I was trying to look up and make sure what she would have understanding she was saying. I don't think Robert Blum, was he a dictator? Does anybody know? I can look it up real quick. I, I was trying to look it up too, and I didn't see him as a dictator. What did you Google? Uh, Robert, Robert, Robert Blum, Blum and dictator? dictator, probably, yeah. Okay. And so, um, so let's see, and they want to match it up with 19... 18 because this is where a dictator is raised up. Consider the revolutions. What is 1918, November 9? It's the end of a revolution, which is in our case not so because we're not at the end of the revolution until 2019. All it says is Robert Blum, November 10th, that's 1807 through November 9th, 1848. So he died on November 9th, right. 1848, was a German democratic politician, published, um, publicist and poet, publisher, revolutionist, and member of the National Assembly of 1848. In his fight for a strong, unified Germany, he opposed um, ethnocentrism. Um, you know, when one nation is better than the other, I think. Okay. Um, and it was his strong belief that no no one, no one people should rule over another. So he's not a, but he's not a dictator. Yeah. He's a globalist. Okay, so let me reword re that again, or reread that again. So they took the history of 1918. She's talking about the article, the Time Magazine article of 1918, and they want, in the article, they want to make 1918, 2016, and, and say that they line up. Um, but we're not marking it 2016, we're marking it 2019. And why is it not 2016? Um, because I went back and reviewed the video just to make sure I heard her correctly, because she said, we see the death of a dictator in 2016. The death that happened, what she's talking about here, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, is this um, Robert Blum in 1848. And, and uh, but we see in here, you have the Kaiser advocate in 1918. Um, but what they were doing was lining up 2016, the election of Trump, as this Kaiser advocating. She's, and we she's, been, up. she's saying exactly what we're saying is that it doesn't match up because he wasn't a dictator. Right, because he wasn't a dictator. Okay. I guess I had a little hard time trying to trying to get that straight in my head because he wasn't a dictator, yeah. There's an article on Robert B, on Robert, this guy talking about it, who wrote a column about on democracy and dictatorship, and it's about Donald Trump. Okay. So let's see, it's the end of a revolution, which is in our case, not so, because we're not at the end of the revolution until 2019. So this was a symbolic ending of a revolution, but it was not the end of the revolution. Um, we have the histories of the French Revolution and Civil War, and they don't end at 2016. 1863 lines up with 2014, and 1865 lines up with October 22nd, which is a shut door. And there's no shut door in 2016. So in 2016, what we saw in the election, the Battle of Ipsus, what we see is the death of the establishment, but not the death of the dictator. Wow, so does Robert Blum represent that, the death of, of the establishment? I, I don't know. Let's keep reading. Oh. Um, that's, where, that's where my mind went to, oh. is the death of the establishment. So we have to take the end of a revolution to a shut door. So the shut door is at 2019, not at 2016. This is where we disagree with this article. We've connected a November 9 with another November 9, and where they're taking it is 2016, Ipsos. We're saying it's Rafia, but still a November 9, um, 2019. We wanted to see if we have any historical evidence to explain November 9 in 2016. Then we looked for this one and we found that in Germany, they have another November 9. The first one marked in, the, in their history, which is 1848 revolutions. How did we explain 1848? There's a revolution in Europe. 1848 is back in the Millerite history, and we also placed it using internal history. 1850 is the second chart, the 1850 chart, and what do we call this way mark? 1850 is the loud cry two years before you have this revolution in Europe. 
and we'll paraphrase a passage from it. So we'll skip to the next screen here in just a second. So like I was saying, this is 1850. When the 1850 chart came out, it was to be the loud cry. But this is a symbolic death um, here, or end of a revolution, symbolic end of a revolution. It marks a turning point in a revolution, but not the end. And so, so the loud cry in 2018. Wait, say that again, because it sounded like you just contradicted. You said that this is a symbol. This it's a symbolic, symbolic end of the revolution. Right, but then you said it is. Because it was with his death, it was a turning point in the revolution, but it wasn't the end of the revolution. Okay. When but Robert Bloom died, it wasn't the end of the revolution. It was a turning point in the revolution. So in 2016, it's not the end of the revolution. It's a turning point. When Trump was elected, it's a turning point in the revolution. Mm -hmm. Right, I get it. So in October, there's a revolution in Vienna. Robert Blum traveled there and joined the revolution. When Vienna surrenders, Blum is arrested. Blum or Bloom, I don't know which it is. Bloom, okay, is arrested on November 4th. He's executed November 9th. His death became a symbol of the futility of the revolution, that it would be futile or pointless, a failed attempt. Attempt. The article is marking that November 9, 1848. But did the revolution end on that day? No, it symbolically ends. It's taken as a symbol of how futile the revolution was, and it's two years before a loud cry. When they say futile, they're talking about pointless. pointless. Okay. Pointless. Where would we place that in our history? Loud cry. Where would we place loud cry in our history? We place that at 2018. Um, let's see, two years before we mark it 2016, which is the Battle of Ipsus. So when is the loud cry in our history? We've already said the revolution ends in 2019, November 9th. 2018 marks the loud cry. And as we've studied also Heraclea, right? Yes, Ipsus, Heraclea, Ascalon, right. and Beneventum. Is there any other November 9th in history? 2016 has a November 9, 1848, November 9, Robert Bloom is executed. It's marking a turning point in a revolution, but not the end of a revolution. Two years before our internal loud cry. So you see this in 1848, you see two years before what would be, going back to the Millerite history, the loud cry, two years before, you see this not the end of a revolution, but a turning point. So 2016 marks a turning point when Trump is elected. Where would we place that on our reform line? If it's two years before the loud cry, it would be 2016. Oh, that makes sense. So the end of the revolution is November 9th, right? November 9th, 2019. Yeah, 2019, yeah. yeah. But 2016, the election. It's a turning it's point. It's a turning point. Yeah, but it, actually, it doesn't end there, but it actually ends November, and that's when it becomes a dictator. Whoa, that, that makes sense because he's not, well, he's always a dictator. He's a dictator, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's a turning point in the revolution because it's this change, you know, it's no longer the old way. Establishment. The establishment. The old yeah. establishment. Yeah, and then it finalizes on November 9th when he officially officiates somehow that he's a dictator. Yeah. So let's see, it's two years before the loud cry would be 2016. So we see a way mark within the revolution, but not the end of the revolution, but it's still in November 9th. So um, it still marks because he was elected on November 9th, right? Yeah. And so you've got this November 9, 1848, marking a turning point, but not an end to a revolution. So you have another November 9 here. And kind of like, I didn't, I didn't have it in these notes, but what I put on here, I sent, oh, no, I didn't send this one out to everybody. I guess I could just show it to you because it's on my phone. Um, <laughs> but it was what I described a few minutes ago before we started, the November 9, 2019, November 9, 2016, and then November 9, also 2013. So there's all these November 9s that are culminating coming to 2019. You didn't send this out? I did, but not when I added that this morning. Oh. So we, so we ha do have a historical precedent to identify why the election of Donald Trump is November 9. 
the Time Magazine article that we read said that 1918 is 2016. And this, was, this article was written, I think, like a week after the election when they were making these connections. It was the Time Magazine article that was pointing out all these November 9s um, and going back into German history. And we're saying 1918 is 2019 because 1918 is the end of a revolution, not just a stepping stone. I hope I said that right. 1918 is, yeah, I had in my head that I said it backwards. And we're saying 1918 is 2019 because 1918 is the end of the revolution, not just a stepping stone. So um, right here, 1918 is the end. This is the graphic that shows that this is what they're lining up the Kaiser advocating with here, they're lining it up with the Time Magazine with uh, Ipsos. But what we're saying is it's the end of a revolution. So 2016 is a point within a revolution and it's showing the futility. So it, 2016, um, I don't think I have that one on here. Yeah, 2016, and this was here from last week. It was supposed to be Sunday law, if anybody remembers me with that being wrong. So so you've got the Republican horn broken here, and they're showing that, that it's futile, that Trump is now the president, and your revolu the revolution is now futile, pointless, because the death of the establishment, and he's going forward with his ways. So it's futile, essentially futile after the election of Donald Trump. 1848 was a history of failure. Robert Bloom was the one fighting for a democratic Germany. He was put down in, on November 9th, 1848, by a government that wasn't willing to accept democracy. It doesn't matter if we make it Obama or Clinton in 2016, because both of them can be seen as representing the ancestors. If everybody remembers that from Ipsos, um, where Clinton represented the ancestors, where Antigonus represented uh, Alexander, the ancestor, the father. So both Clinton and Obama represent the founding fathers. What does the name Clinton mean? We'll discuss this in our next class. So I haven't gotten to that part either. So what does the name Clinton mean? So does everybody follow that? Does that make sense? I'll look it up. That they are marking November 9 in that magazine. Uh, this November 9, 1918 with 2016 in Ipsos, but we are marking it here because this marks the end of a revolution. You also have the, the, the French Revolution and the Civil War all marking the same point. It's the end of a revolution. <clears throat> it wasn't until the late 1920s that Germany Ooh, came up. It means settlement on a hill or from the headland what is it? Clinton. Oh, Clinton? Yeah, it means settlement Maybe I on a that. hill or from the headland um, estate from an old English surname and place name. Yeah, that's interesting, settlement. A settlement on a hill. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like it's in Capitol Hill? Capitol Hill is what I, well, yeah, that's what I was just about to say. A settlement on Didn't a hill. I, uh, which Clinton were you referring to, was it? It just said Clinton. It came up in the class, but she's gonna talk about it more in the next one. But the settlement on a it makes me think city on a hill, but I don't know. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> well, settlement on a hill. I mean, if it's talking about Bill Clinton, wasn't he being impeached and wasn't there a settlement? In Capitol uh -huh. hill? I don't know. Something along those lines. That's all I got. <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't until the late 1920s that Germany came up with the name Schicksalstag. I don't know if I said it right, but I checked the spelling, so the spelling's right. Schicksalstag which means day of fate or day of destiny. And you can look it up there, the link is there. It's the German word to reference the 9th of November because the history of the country keeps being made on the 9th of November. The reason this phrase was used because it was actually part of the Nazi propaganda. Got my punctuation wrong there too, so forgive me. We started to discuss Hitler and his role and experience through the history of World War I. We read what he actually did in that history, and it's completely different from what he writes in his autobiography. As he writes in his autobiography, it's probably propaganda that he's invented. He uses this day, November 9, as a propaganda tool 
because there's a lot of national pain that's connected to this day that gives him something to manipulate. So most of Mein Kampf is a buildup to this November 9, when he said that after all this suffering, he resolved to become a politician. The next November 9 that we mark in that history is the coup in 1923. Then in 1927, this is Alfred Rosenberg, the person that really built his propaganda machine, and he recorded the story of these two November 9s, 1918 and 1923. This story became the backbone of Nazi propaganda. So he invented the word Schicksalstag in 1927, meaning the day of fate to refer to November 9. So correct me if I'm wrong, help me remember this part. When um, Hitler, oh, I lost my train of thought here. Hitler marks November 9. I have to come back to it because I lost my train of thought here. The, the broken glass, is that? No, 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 not the broken glass. Oh. Um, not the broken yeah. glass. Um, oh, because when the Navy, when the sailors mutinied, they turned against the government, they turned against their country, right? So I do have that correct case. Okay, so they turned against their country and that's what, that's what he used November 9 for, was to, he, he placed it as the people of the country being traitors to their own country. So that Trump is actually calling people traitors of their country. He is calling people traitors of their countries. Anybody who speaks against him is a traitor. He's a traitor to the country. Yeah. <laughs> because he believes he is the country. Yeah. Well, not, I mean, the country is not the people, the, peop the country is him now. Well, in some cases, um, I kind of whispered that to Sister Tony because you can't separate a king from his kingdom. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in some ways he had a point. And yet this kingdom is, is about the people. It was established right, exactly. to be about the people. Exactly. He's going back to the divine right. Right. See what Google says about this Shikos tag. Has been occasionally used by historians and journalists since shortly after World War II, but its currently widespread use started with the events of 1989. <laughs> 1989? Yeah. And that's when that's when all German media picked up the term. Why? What happened there that made them do that? The, that's the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. November no, in November 9th. November 9th in Germany. So let's see. What? And, and that's what makes me think when Nancy Pelosi says that this is a monarch, this is a democracy, not a monarchy, because in Trump's mind, he's it's the a king, monarchy. Yeah, the, he's the king of this, of this country. Cyrus. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's ah. telling him he is on his side. Yeah. Yeah. They are telling him that he's the savior. It's going to come and save us, just like just like Hitler believed he was a savior to go save his country. Um, so Schicksalstag um, means day of fate, and it's um, equals to November nine. So we haven't discussed this one yet, but in 1938, the night of broken glass, the Jewish persecution, there's been an assassination attempt on Hitler's life because part of the propaganda he's used, usually doing speeches on that on this date as he made it a national holiday. So I think we discussed that before, that he made November 9 a national holiday. Um, so that people would be, so he played on the people's emotions using this November 9 date. So again, this was the secular world that, that saw all this, was bringing this all up um, right after his election, recognizing yeah. the, the connection between all these November 9th, Schicksalstag, Day of Fate, to November 9, 2016. You can see why they were making the connection, because they were seeing the Day of Fate, they're just not seeing the end. The last date we're going to discuss, and then we're finished with revolutions, is 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall. When we discuss these November 9s, other than on the persecution of the Jews, it wasn't something that was planned, but it was just something that happened on that date. That isn't why the Berlin Wall fell on November 9th. So we'll go to the Russian Revolution. It's 1917, and they're opposing Tsar Nicholas. The revolution against Tsar Nicholas also known as the Bolshevik Revolution. 
It starts on the 8th of March, 1917. On this day, thousands of people took to the streets. Again, in Russia, prior to the war ending in Germany, the Russian people have the same thoughts or feelings. They're tired of World War I and they want it to end. So the people begin to rise up against the Tsar and on the 15th of March, he abdicates and there's a new government placed that lasts until the 27th of October in 1917. This is the Bolsheviks. We call this Red October, this final end of the revolution. Why do we call it Red October? Communism comes with the connection right. of the color red. And they actually got it from the French Revolution. So um, we're going to continue to look more, which I think is... I had a question that I was thinking about, and maybe some of you guys can help me answer it on just my thoughts, because like I said, I just, I still don't understand war and all the games that they play, but um, when it comes to the um, Russian, I'll, I'll, I'll pass that and I'll come on back to it later. We'll just keep going forward here. What happened, Mark? Oh, I know. When it comes to, we're in World War One. But while they're in World War I, they're also having civil war revolution in their own countries. If I'm following this correctly, right? World How War I. They stand back with each other. It's like the, the house divided against each other. Right. Because what were the dates of World War I? It ended 1918, right? 1919? I figured some of you guys had that. Quick to your head. 1918, but it wasn't officially, officially over till 1919. And then it kind of never really ended I in this kind of case. Yeah. But okay, yeah. so so during this time, Germany has its own <laughs> internal revolution. And during this time, Russia has its own internal revolution. How can anybody be fighting if you're all fighting amongst yourselves? The same way we're doing The now. same way we're doing now. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Oh, it um it started July um 28th 1914 to november 11th 1918 but then the germans got smart and they started to use russia's revolutions against them because it gave opportunity they were actually all using their others revolutions against them because there was a huge one happening in the uk people were so against the war and the president was having a really really hard time trying to get troops so that they could actually fight the war and there was this huge situation where people finally learned in this war how to use propaganda this was a yep, big thing where propaganda was really developed in little pamphlets and flyers yeah. and pictures depicting of the bad and the good and all this and propaganda now it's information warfare but they had a big thing to do with World War One and propaganda. But information warfare still uses propaganda. Propaganda has not died. I know, I'm saying it's oh. in the, in the oh, okay. form of information warfare, like electronically. Now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. Which propaganda can be bad or good, but it's right. probably the best. Yeah. Anyway. So you got the Russian Revolution, um, the Tsar, at Advocates, is he advocate? Uh, let's see, I'll go back in Russia. Let's see, the revolution is the Bolshevik Revolution. It starts on the 8th. In this day, thousands of people took to the streets again in Russia prior to the war ending in Germany. The Russian people have the same thoughts or feelings. They're tired of the war. Okay, so then the people rise up against the Tsar on the 15th and he abdicates. And there's a new government in place. What does abdicate mean again? Step, he, he take, step down? down from the throne. Okay. Oh, okay. Got a mistake in here. I tried to clear out all these, so there's going to be some of these in here. The red symbolized blood, but it was meant to symbolize the blood of the workers, which was being sacrificed for the upper classes. In the French Revolution, it became the color red, and it spread across also to the Bolsheviks. We call it Red October because they're using the Julian calendar, which places this end of the revolution in October on the 25th and 26th. The night of the 25th, the Bolsheviks took Petrograd, and on the 26th, they took the Winter Palace, which was the last holdout of the provisional government. The revolution began on the 8th, the 15th the Tsar abdicates, and this weak government holds power until the 25th and 26th of October, 
where Lenin leads the Bolsheviks and takes control and takes power. We could mark this as the 25th and 26th of October using the Julian calendar. So you can see here that these are the Julian dates here. By this point in time, Russia is the only one using the Julian calendar still. Other countries like the United States sometime before had changed to the Gregorian. In the Gregorian calendar, this is the 7th and 8th of November when they take, to, when they take the Winter Palace. So Lenin um, wasn't, He's, um, wasn't he like a, he was a dictator mm -hmm. too. So the people are wanting him to be ruling them? Or, because he, he was, he that. was the Bolsheviks that overturned Tsar Nicholas. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to have a counter revolution. Oh, so okay. They're going to have a counter revolution. Okay. But the point is, why do they call it Red October? Because they were still using the Julian calendar. And, and when they took Petrograd and the Winter Palace, on, their, on the Julian calendar, it was October 25th and 26th. But on the Gregorian, which everyone else was using, was November 7th and 8th. So you can see where that's heading. Mm -hmm. Then on the 9th of November, Lenin restricts the press. That's another dictator. <laughs> dictator. Mm -hmm. um, he restricts the press. So that would put us at November 9, 1917, as October 27, where do we know that number 27 from? Acts 27? Acts 27, and what else? And um, Daniel. Oh, Daniel's the 27th book. In Revelation. Uh, yeah. 27th book. And there might be others. And then on November 9th, Lenin restricts the press. On the 9th of November, it's the 27th of October. We need to know that we mentioned previously the connection between the number 27 and November 9. This is the first one we need to consider. November 9th is the Gregorian, in the Gregorian is the 27th of October in, Ju in the Julian. And this is the first Bolshevik decree censoring the press. So hmm, what does that mean? Does that mean anything to what has gone on right here at the end of October actually? On the 27th? I don't know because did Trump censor, I mean he's already been censoring the press but they still kind of, it's not fully censored though because people are still having the freedom to, to speak even though he's, he, how he's, you know, censoring it is by accusing them of being fake news but, you know, he, he can't really, he hasn't had the power to really shut down as he really wants to, the media. Let's see here. So what do we think makes Donald Trump a dictator? In the history, in this history leading up to the decree of the press, we usually call it the October Revolution, Red October. We would mark the 25th, 26th, and the 27th, the three dates that we're looking at. They take Petrograd, they take the last hideout of the provisional government, and then they restrict the press freedom. This is, in the, this is the Julian calendar, but we use the Gregorian calendar by this date in the United States. We already used it for a couple of hundred years. The 25th of October is the 7th of November. The 26th is the 8th of November. The 27th is the 9th of November. So we're connecting 27 and November 9. That's interesting. I don't know. I just thought about three times nine equals 27, but that's just something else. <laughs> All these nines, yeah. <laughs> so what is the first step of every dictator to restrict the press? Why was Napoleon able to come back from Egypt and very quickly take over the government? He's in Egypt. There's a fall of the army. And what he began to set up was a propaganda machine. He controlled all the news that got through to his army. He put out his own newspaper to feed information to the troops regarding that, what was happening back home in France. Prior to the end of the revolution, you already have a propaganda machine. So is that Fox News right there? That's his uh, propaganda, propaganda machine. machine, Fox News. And he already started using it to control the viewpoint of his army. Soon after the revolution ended, he released one paper and said this is the only one that speaks for the government. Because he realized, unless he continued to control the media, 
he would lose power. So when Lenin takes the government, his first step on, November, on the 9th of November is to censor the press. Oh, so he hasn't yet censored it. I mean, but he's just called him the enemy of the right, state. Right. And the en but uh, he's, yeah. But Fake he's, news enemy. Yeah. But he's going to get to the point where he does censor the press, like literally, or is this just still? Looks like Yeah, it. that's what I'm seeing too. And we, if you look at, so when Lenin takes the government, his first step, what did it say there? That um, soon after the revolution ended, he released one paper and said this is the only one that speaks for the government because he realized unless he continued to control the media, he would lose power. Right. And Trump knows that, that he loves the media. He knows that's how he gets, he keeps his control. Once you um, shut down the fake news. Um, yeah. What's his name? Lenin knows what media does because he made an anti-government paper before he was exiled. He had his own anti-government newspaper that was speaking against the Russian government. So when he came to power, he knew what those were speaking against the media. So he did it. He did it too, what they were doing. Well, Trump, yeah, and that's true because Trump had, he was, um, he had Trump his own TV. show. Yeah, he had his own show and everything. So he knows what the media can do. <clears throat> he says it because of this critical time period that we are in, we've been forced to take a couple of steps and we've been forced to restrict the freedom of the press. This is speaking of, um, paraphrasing of Lenin that we've been forced to restrict the freedom of the press. We're encouraged to go and read this because Donald Trump couldn't have written it better. What he's saying is that it's fake news, a liberal pretense that's being controlled by the wealthy to poison the minds of the masses. He said it's one of the most powerful weapons they have, the most powerful weapon of the establishment. We're in this time period where the workers are starting to speak. It is this crucial moment where they're starting to speak, but they're still weak. And this liberal press machine is a weapon, just as much as bombs and guns are. This is what, she's paraphrasing from the article, what Lenin said, that, that it's just, that a, the liberal press is just as much a weapon as bomb, bombs and guns are. This liberal press controlled by the establishment wants to drown the recent victory of the common people. All it sends out is filth and lies. He said, as soon as the country is in order, we'll give back the press their freedom as long as they restrain themselves with some legal responsibilities. wonder what that means. That. You still do what I say, because I'm the law. Because yeah. it's legal responsibilities they're making a law. Yeah. They're only restrained as much as necessary. This is what paraphrasing what Lenin said. It's only they're only restrained as much as necessary. It's the exact same argument that Donald Trump is using. They're fake news. They're controlled by the establishment. They put out filth and lies. Well, it makes me think about that bomb, the bombs and guns, because when you think of Cambridge Analytica and how they affect the minds of the people, that once you have the mind of a, pe of a person, you can change the world. Mm -hmm. And we can see that. And that's, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know. That's, that is really interesting that the media does play a role in influencing mind upon mind. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Donald Trump also says that they're filled with, they put out filth and lies. He said that the media is the greatest enemy of the people. They are greater, they, they're our greater enemy to, um, let's see. They're a greater enemy to the people than, they are a greater enemy to the people than, to, than Russia is. So the media, which explains when he goes to Helsinki and he defends what Putin did over his own intelligence agency, he says the media is more dangerous to us than Russia. So Sir Jackie asks, how does it fit with impeachment when the Constitution is being upheld? I'm not sure when she, um, or appealed, I'm not sure when she asked that question, so I don't know at what point that was really regarding. With the Constitution? She said, how does it fit with impeachment when the Constitution is still being upheld? It depends on what you call upheld, because you've got the Democrat side wanting to defend the Constitution, but you also have the Republican side defending it from their perspective. Because they read it different. Yeah, it's true. 
Sister Jackie, did you want to expand to help us kind of make sense of the context of your question? Sister Jackie? Oh, yeah, here I am. Oh. Uh, how does it constrict Trump from really taking over when this impeachment process is going on and most of the press, the liberal press anyway, is, is backing uh, the Constitution, Pelosi and everyone? Well, that's who he's going to restrict. And to what it previously said about Lenin, that he knew that you know, the only way he could maintain power was to restrict them. Um, so would that mean that Trump's going to know that he's going to have to do this? Because people are That's his last resort. If, right. he's, if he, has to t he has to take the power and be, just take it over completely without anything. I mean, yeah. nobody can hold him back. He'll just take it over then. And that is November 9 marks that where he's now less restrained. You've got the death of a dictator and the of one form of the dictator and the birth of a new form of a dictator. That's sad because when you see you about that meltdown he had and then just to see that's the ultimate of his meltdown is just complete madness and taking over the world. Yeah. <laughs> and his like right out of a movie, right? Out of a movie, right? Is it is it possible? I'm just going to put an idea out there, but I don't know if it'll actually make sense. If Putin is going to release, let's say he's going to release some information. Now we're, we're assuming that he's going to release some information about Trump. It's going to be a pyrrhic victory. Whatever information he releases is going to hurt him as much as it hurts Trump. But is it possible that Putin actually releases information that supports Trump and hurts America? Because this is the only opportunity that they have in an, at an impeachment impeachment and if he has information that he can release that will validate trump in some way and and throw out the the impeachment process it would be a loss for him it would be a loss for america it would just be a win for trump but i don't know if we can do that as rafia being a loss for america and not a loss for trump yeah I have to think that through. Go, say, you might want to say that again for me anyway, so I don't know about anybody else. So the pyrrhic victory that's going to come on November 9th, what, I'm just su suggesting what if it was Putin releasing information that actually vindicates Trump and the whole Ukraine phone call thing. So it actually, it relieves him from responsibility. The impeachment process is thrown out. They'll never be able to impeach him again to even come into a, to even try to do it again because this is, they waited, you know, a long time to make this happen. And if it gets ruined because of some information, uh -huh. then do you know what I mean? Like then it would be a loss for America because Trump would then be, be able to become a dictator, be able to push forward. Um, you know, he's already bypassed the constitution with the withdrawing of, of troops from, um, from Syria, which was a congressional decision. So he's bypassed Congress and that. He's, you know, he's broke the constitution just to get elected. There's no question that he's already a dictator. It's just the only thing restraining him right now is it's the other two branches of government. And really it's only one because he's got the judicial branch stacked. Yeah. So it's, it's Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats right now that are standing between him and a dictatorship and Putin. He's hanging on to something right now. It's either information against Trump or it's information for Trump? I'll, I'll be curious to see. I mean, we can only really speculate, but I don't know if we can do that with, with saying Rafia is a victory, is a, is a loss for, is it a loss for the United States or is it a loss for Trump? Is Sister Lana with us today? She was this morning, but I don't know if she's still I don't here. see this, I don't see the whole um, screen. Just because I know that she's pointed out how the reason Putin did what he did to get Trump elected was to be again to, to do purposely against the Americans. Yeah. That that he that he would um, wipe out America as we know it because he hates America. Not that he hates Trump, but he hates America. Well, he knows Trump in the off Trump in the White House is is working to his favor because he's polarized the nation. He's weakened the nation. Yeah. 
So he wants Trump in office. He doesn't want a strong democratic president in office because he can't do anything because the country's united. That's the only way that he can win is if he divides the country. So he wants Trump in there. So I can't, I, I've been struggling with that because I can't see him doing anything that's going to hurt Trump at this point. He did so much to get him there. He's not going to throw all that out. Well, unless, because we still have the November 9, 2013 event um, to be exposed. And, and by doing so, that's just going to, I don't know, doesn't that, wouldn't that show the American people who he really is? It's going to reveal who he really is, and is that going to embolden him? What was November 9, 2013? When he was in Russia in the, um, at the beauty pageant, and they have, well, the mm. stories go, it's in the Steele dossier that um, the Russians recorded him in a hotel room with a bunch of women. Mm. Mm -mm. I think he's going to he's he's going to do another state of emergency like he did. He tested the waters earlier this year by by um, declaring a state of emergency, and he he got a little blowback from from different people. So now he knows how to bypass that, and and when he throw the country into a state of emergency, you know, maybe after 2020, you know, if he, uh, well, I don't know, you know, he, he might do it beforehand just to stay in power and, and go all the way through 2020 and just take over the country. So, so um, you have the exact same mindset from Lenin to Trump regarding the press. It's worth noting, Steve Bannon, he said he wants to repeat the work of Lenin because he studied this history. So if <laughs> Trump has the mindset of Lenin and Bannon was the one that got Trump where he's at and Russia, that um, Bannon wants to repeat the work of Lenin because he studied this history. And see, that's the thing, though, with all of them, the Christian rights and the, um, what you call it, the national, what is that, the NRA, or what, no. The National is, Reform Movement? No. No. Um, Rival Association? Yeah, or, yeah, some, no, it's one group. It's coming out from the Christian rights, or, and it starts with an N, I can't remember. But, yeah, when they study, they study politics, because before that, they didn't know anything. And so when you have Steve Bannon and all these people you know, a part of those dom, you know, the the dominus or dominionists or whatever. They study these histories. They study politics, and this is how they know, you know, to how to work the system in their favor. And it's just crazy. That's what I was learning when um, which is amazing, Kathy McGaw. Uh, right. Yeah. Which is amazing. If we'd study history, we'd also know, right? <laughs> yeah. Of what we need to know. That's yeah. interesting. So this is what Steve Bannon wants for the United States. So we can connect the 27th of October to November 9. This suggests that this attack on the press, it's what makes a dictator a dictator. So it suggests that he's gonna do an attack on the press, November 9. But if you think about it, the mindset of some people are gonna be cheering it on, that it's necessary. They're gonna go right along with it, that it's necessary, yeah. right? And yeah. so they're not gonna notice they're not even going to realize what they, you know, the thought that's been going through my mind is, is people ought to be careful what they wish for I'm, I because guess. they don't know what, what they wish for is going to look like when it comes. Right. And that's what came to my mind too, was the concern of the government thing. And I forgot my thought, you know, I just lost my thought. But anyway, say you're, when Ellen G. White says you're responsible for who you put in office, mm -hmm. they're responsible for all that he's doing. And it's not saying that we can't vote for, someone to be in office you know for our dispensation our time is be careful for who you put in office and who you put in there because you're responsible for what happens and the founders laid it upon the people to be able to discern to have that wisdom to know who's going to fight for their rights who's going to continue to fight for the constitution who's going to fight for their freedom and if you don't have a people with that mindset, then you're going to get someone like Trump in office. So that's pretty much what happened. So this is the establishment of the Bolsheviks. 
Shortly after they take the Winter Palace, their enemies start together. They take time to prepare. They don't come together until 1918. All those opposed to the Bolsheviks put aside their differences and engage in a counter-revolution. And this lasts until 1922. We have it up here in this counter-revolution. And the Soviet Union is created. This was the Red Army versus the White Army. Like we said, Red October, red representing the Bolsheviks. But over here, you have the White Army engaging in a counter-revolution. What they're wanting to reestablish is the Tsar. They want to go back to this form of government that had been toppled with this, within this revolution before Lenin. So I have a question because I'm still trying to grapple with a lot of these things. So when we're going to see counter-revolution here, we see a period of preparation. You got November 9, Donald Trump restricts the press, whatever he's going to do, secrets being revealed, um, all these things that are to happen. You've got this preparation and this, um, because from, from what I'm understanding, from what I've been reading and going through these studies, is this counter-revolution is to counter this. Is that correct? So the counter-revolution is going to counter Trump? Um, it says right, they want yeah. the old establishment. Is if, if Tsar Nicholas was the old establishment, does that represent the fathers? Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me. That's what I thought it was sounding like, but but they want they want to bring back the establishment that they previously had. Which establishment are you talking about? Because they might think bring America back to Christian again. Uh well, isn't that what isn't that what Trump is doing with in being in um, with Paula White and all of those Christian? Because um, right? that's what they're doing. Uh, yeah, that's what they're doing. So, what does the what does the counter revolution do if they want to bring back the old establishment? Isn't the old establishment the foundation of the fathers? Depends. Does Depends on how far back you go. Yeah. If you're if you're saying the counter revolution is is against, are you saying it's against Trump or for Trump? Well, what I'm asking is if um, 2016 marks the turning point in the revolution, right? It's the revolution, and the revolution is to overturn the founding fathers, yeah. right? It's to is that what the revolution was? It, isn't that what they're trying to do in this revolution? They're trying to overturn and bring back Christianity? Well, here's the thing. There's two revolutions happening, the revolution and the counter-revolution. Right, one follows the other. What's the first revolution? The first revolution is 9-11 to, to, to 2019, where they're trying to overturn the founding fathers, right? Do they're I have that? Over, they're trying to overturn the Constitution, so the return would be back to the Constitution, wouldn't it? That's, right. Yeah, that's what I think I'm trying to say. Are you sure that's yeah. the revolution? Mm -hmm. I thought it was the liberal revolution, because they were trying to bring in all this gender stuff, and they were the ones who, um, uh, what is it? Um, Black Lives Matter and um, Antifa and all of them were rioting in the streets and causing this huge mayhem. Maybe that's why I'm struggling to understand this then. Yeah, I thought that's what it was because you had a climax in 2016 when Donald Trump was elected and you had the oh. women's march and all of that. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump is saying, well, now there's going to be a civil war if you're going to do this to me. So his people are going to come out, I thought was going to be the counter-revolution fighting for him. But this, but this revolution... You're saying the liberals are the revolution. I thought that's what Tess was teaching. And maybe it is, because it's stuff that I'm still struggling to try to understand myself, because, because what, the, what Trump and Bannon and all of them are trying to do is trying to stop it all. So who's the revolution, them or the Republicans? Well, if you look at, if you look at, if you look at the French Revolution, what, what, who would you say the French Revolution represented? If we were to line it up with today, go ahead. Say what you're. Oh, well, the, the French Revolution was they they basically they were it was like godlessness and the god of reason and they were they wanted God out of the out of the state. So when we think of the French Revolution, we think of it as, I mean, there's two different ways of looking at it because the revolution was essentially the liberals were were rising up against the the far right, but the reason why they were rising up was because there was church and state in Europe and they were trying to drag it into France and these people knew what the end result was going to be so they that's why the revolution happened so you could argue that the French Revolution was actually a, a counter-revolution because there already was a church and state and so if you look at the United States it's the exact same thing 
the church has been meddling with the state long before this liberal uprising. And it's the reason why they, why they, why they're rising up because they saw it. And so they're rising up and it's being called a revolution. But the reason why they're rising up was because there already was a revolution happening within the country. So it was kind of like that, what the liberals are doing is a counter revolution. And what are you saying the liberals are as far as those, are you talking about the Black Lives Matters and all of that? Or what are you referring yeah. to? Any, anyone, like there's, if you have Trump and then anyone that was opposed to the Trump so revolution. I go back, to, I think, cause I mean, it's so many things for me to try to have inside my head at once and I'm struggling with it. So going back to my main question then, so the counter revolution that is after November 9, um, because, what I was going through in these in these presentations is that that counter revolution is to counter the government that they now put in place that they put in place. So the counter revolution goes against Trump, if I understood correctly. Anybody? The Bolshevik is this in line with the Bolsheviks? Because the the Bolsheviks were. Oh, I got to look into that again. Well, let's keep reading and see where we where we go to here. Um, I think I read the first paragraph that drew, yeah, the White Army. And it says what they're wanting to establish, the, the White Army and the counter-revolution, what they're wanting to establish is the czar. They want to go back to this form of government that had been toppled by the Bolshevik Revolution. The Bolshevik Revolution, the Bolsheviks were led by Lenin. And Lenin is being compared to Trump. So the Bolsheviks were essentially, they're the, the Bolsheviks are the mega, it's the mega movement and right. they've overthrown the current, the current government. So the return to the current government would be a constitutional government. That's what, that's, that's what, what I, Lane that's said. what I've been thinking this was saying. Yeah. Said. Okay. So somebody asked a question. There was a clarification. The white army was the side that was fighting for the monarchy which is interesting. The Tsar Nicholas was a monarchy but we're not looking at the old establishment as a monarchy. So after Lenin takes power in 1917, some of those that were opposed to the Bolsheviks put aside their differences and then they fought against Lenin. And this history is known as white terror because it's the white army that is trying to remove the Bolsheviks from power. It's known as the Russian Civil War. If you were to look for this in history, 1917 is the history of the Russian Revolution. 1918 to 1922 they're called the Russian Civil War. First, there's a revolution that places Lenin, but not everyone is happy with him, so the whole country descends into civil war. It's so, whoa, so not everybody's happy with Trump. With Trump. And the and whole country true. descends into civil war. Hmm. It's in this history past 1922, we see Stalin start to take power, but they had many internal problems in this country so he was held back in that history. That's the crazy. last major rebellion ended in 1922. And they say from November of 1917 through the spring of 1918, people began to choose sides, white army or red army. But that's crazy because Stalin is a dictator too, or was a right. dictator too. So right. what? They went from dictator to dictator. What does that right. mean? So they that's went all from... they ever knew. They never had a democracy there. So all they ever knew was one person leading everyone or another person leading everyone, they never had any people. I mean, but at least they can choose somebody good leading them. They thought they were, though. Because they had, you didn't have just Lenin, you had Trotsky, too. And they had this revolutionary new mindset that no one had ever heard of before, that the government before was trying to suppress. And they had, like, the, the love that these people had for these ideas, there was, um, if you look in that video, Lenin and Trotsky from that one presentation we cited, the guys were like, people believed in their theology so much, they hated what they had to vote for and they did it with tears in their eyes, but they signed the ballots to pass whatever it was that they did. It was when there was the um, giving in to Germany and ending the war. They did it with tears in their eyes, but they said, this is what our beliefs are saying. It was like, it's crazy. They had Trotsky and Lenin, the work they did in Russia was huge. I think it was interesting in history to look at. I wish Lana was here. <laughs> yeah. So we want to consider one, one last revolutionary period, 
And this is taking us back to the French Revolution. When we study that revolution, we can find a secondary application, kind of like with Ipsos, there was a different perspective or another application. So in the French Revolution, there's a secondary application because that history comes in the form of a revolution, then counter-revolution. The French Revolution, and maybe this is what um, Jonathan was just, uh, maybe, maybe might have been saying, help me if I'm wrong there. The French Revolution is a 10 year period from 1789 to 1799. We call that 10 year period the French Revolution. But if we go further into that history, within those 10 years is the same model. So like a fractal within it. So um, there's revolution, then counter revolution. The revolution was 1789 to, to 1794. What they're toppling is the monarchy, the king. We call this time period the reign of terror, and this happens under the Jacobins. This first period is the Jacobins had been called, had the, the first period is the Jacobins, and we call it the reign, we call it the reign of terror. We can see the reign of terror people do in, in different ways. You can look at certain specific dates to observe a particular period of time that is violent. But for the purpose of this exercise, half of this revolutionary time is the reign of terror. Mm -hmm. That terror begins 1789 and it ends in 1794 on, of all days, the 27th of October. <coughs> July. Of July. <laughs> so there, the Jacobins in the reign of terror, they want to overthrow the monarchy. That was, the monarchy was Louis, right? The 16th, is that right? I think so. I think so. Okay. I think you want me to look it up? No, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah. In 1793, they introduced a different calendar, a French revolutionary calendar that was designed to remove God, the seven day week, everything that reminded them of that old system. So the 27th of July, 1794, in the revolutionary calendar is the 11th day of the ninth month. This day is known as the Thermidorian reaction. The month in the revolutionary calendar was Thermidor. That's their 11th month. So they called this the Thermidorian reaction. So Thermidor is just the 11th month? Is the 11th month in this French calendar that they created to remove God from everything in the seven day week. And the dictator that has been set up here is Robespierre. On this day, he's taken the government, on this day, he's taken, has governments toppled, but the Jacobins were overthrown. But it took some time to respond to the Jacobins, Jacobins to persecute the people that they've overcome. I think I understood it better when I was going through it the other day. So July 7, 27, 1990, 1794 lines up with 11-9, November, uh, November 9, uh, Thermidorian reaction to be lining up with uh, 2019 mm -hmm. as well. But this is within the French Revolution because we know we've looked at the entire French Revolution to lay it under 9 11 to 2019, but this has taken another perspective or another application, just taking the first half of it from 1789 to 1794. And I, I guess the way to explain it, the way that I might be able to understand it in my head, and correct me if I'm wrong, is a fractal <laughs> of the of the French Revolution. Can someone say like focusing, focusing on is that's not what a fractal does. It just well, you have the the bigger picture, right? But it zooms in. So a fractal yeah, does zoom in, but it's a repeat of this in a smaller. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is the reign of terror that was performed by the Jacobins. Their leader is Robespierre. Their government is overthrown halfway through the revolution in 1794. There are still Jacobins and jo the Jacobin club, so there's a period of preparation before those who overthrew the Jacobins engaged in what is known as the reaction. In 1795, we see a counter-revolution to the end, 1799. This is known as the White Terror. It's orchestrated against those that conducted the reign of terror. So it's against the Jacobins. 
right? This counter-revolution is the white terror, and it's against the ones that brought this about. Did I say that right? I'm, there's a lot here. I know there's a lot of November 9th, but there's a lot here for me to try to keep sorted out in my head. I pray that you guys are getting it better than I do. So let's see. We need to consider why we find white terror in both histories and what that means. There's one other revolutionary, another revolutionary time period we'll look at in our next class. If we just mark these revolutions, what we've learned so far, we've learned that 9-11 to 2019 is the history of a revolution or civil war. Then we took revolutions, the French and the German and the Russian, and we formed a pattern. One thing connects these histories, this concept of the ninth day of the 11th month. And it's interesting because you get to the, well, she's going to say it right here. We find it in the Thermidorian calendar, in the Gregorian, which we used as opposed to the Julian. So all three calendars have a link to November 9 and an and a ending of a revolution and the beginning of a counter-revolution. Our connecting thread is the ninth day of the 11th month, which runs like a state through each revolutionary uh, period. The other pattern we saw revolution is, took us to November 9, then saw a period of preparation, and then, a following, then the following year, a counter-revolution. Revolution ends in 2019. The period of preparation, choosing of sides, counter-revolution is 2020. So where they have these in the Russian Revolution and here in the French Revolution, you have the period of preparation. You got the dictator restricts the press, the dictator, um, the death of a dictator, the rise of a dictator. It's the end of the revolution. There's a period of preparation. 2019, there's a period of preparation. And then 2020 becomes the counter-revolution. And that might be, that's it right there. Until next week. <laughs> Okay, comments. I won't say questions because I don't know that I could answer them, but maybe questions for all of us. <laughs> so there's two reigns of terror we're looking at. And so I'm guessing that's two groups, two different groups. Two reigns of terror. The the white terror and the red terror, right? Yeah, the white in the in the the German one is. Oh, the Russian one. Yeah, the Russian one here. You have the red and then you have the white. The revolution and the counter-revolution. And you have that here as well. In the French Revolution, you have the reign of terror, preparation, and a counter-revolution. What does the white terror represent again? It's the ones that fight. If I'm understanding, follow me. No, I'm talking about the white, though. Yeah. You know how they're, okay. they're the ones that fight against this, what gets set up. Did you? It makes me think of the red blood cells and the white blood cells. You know how uh -huh. the white blood cells are the ones that fight. You know, um, uh -huh. you know, fight the bacteria or fight. Uh -huh. You know, to keep your system going or whatever. And so, um, it makes me think of the white here. And I don't know. I'm trying to understand what the white is significant for because um, they're fighting back. You know, but. Um, I don't understand why they're choosing the word white. Let's try and look it up. I still, I don't know, I'm still thinking like along the lines of Putin setting up Trump at November 9th rather than tearing him down. And if you look at the reign of terror as this building up of a dictatorship from 2001 to 2019, which is a revolution, which is where you had Bush number one, you could actually go back to uh, Bush, or sorry, Bush number one, but at 2001, you have Bush number two, and going into war with Iraq, which was, which Tess said was basically the beginning of a dictatorship within that party. Actually, it was a beginning back with George one when he went to war with Iraq based on a lie. But, but you're leading up to that and then it's like if if Trump was set up on November 9th by Putin and the impeachment was thrown out and there's nothing that the liberals could do anymore, they're going to revolt. Yeah, here, listen to this. This is on Wikipedia. White terror may refer to a common expression to describe anonymous acts that create a climate of fear. White terrorism, 
xenophobic activity or terrorism by white Americans. That's not the same white terror though. That's white, the white terror that you're looking at there is from the French Revolution. Well, that, yeah, there was that too. It, that one was, I'm looking at several of them. Would that, wouldn't that describe what is coming? What about your white collar workers and your blue collar workers? It depends who's, so I think from this, I think you guys are right. I think it's going to be people against Trump who are coming in after November 9th. But on John's remarks, I'm, I have a question on that because um, Khrushchev's midnight speech, it showed the bad side of Stalin. It didn't set him up. And if it strengthened him in a way that um, people that he was justified, then um, I don't know. It just doesn't. It doesn't seem to match because Putin has to win against Trump for Rafia to be a thing. But based off of the lines, you have the impeachments that match with um, in, impeachment, impeachment, and then no Senate removal. And that one isn't, he's not going to get removed from the Senate just based on the fact that there's a Republican majority there. And in all those other two situations, whoever was for the president ended up being the majority of the Senate. And that's why they didn't actually get removed from that office, Clinton or um, Andrew Johnson. Neither of them got removed because their party was the one who was in the majority of the Senate. But that call, the fact that that he doesn't get impeached causes a ruckus, which I could see that's the counter-revolution. But Putin has to win out of this. Yeah, but it's a pirate victory as well. So it's not a win, a real win. There's a lot of things to juggle in my head. I don't know how everybody else feels. Um, <laughs> there's another, um, the white terror in Russia refers to the organized violence and mass killings carried out by the white army during the Russian Civil War. It began after the Bolsheviks seized power in 1917, November 1917, and continued until the defeat of the White Army at the hands of the Red Army. The White Army fought the Red Army for power, which engaged in its own Red Terror. So the White Army engaged in its own Red Terror. According to some Russian historians, the White Terror was a series of pre premeditated actions directed by their leaders. Although this view is contested by others, estimates for those killed in the white terror vary from between 20 to 100,000 people, as well as much higher estimates of 300,000 deaths. Or we see the, the, the color red associated with the MAGA movement as well in a lot of different histories. And so the white terror almost sounds in opposition to the red terror. What's the MAGA movement? MAGA. Oh, MAGA. MAGA or make America great. Oh, oh. Uh, just trying to go into white army, the volunteer army in South Russia became the most prominent and the largest of the various and, dis and disparate white forces. Starting off as a small and well-organized military in January 1918, the voluntary army soon grew. The Kuban Cossacks joined the white army and conscription of both peasants and Cossacks began. In late 19, February 1918, 4,000 soldiers under the command of General Aleski Kaladin were forced to retreat from Rostov on Don due to the advance of the Red Army. In what became known as the Ice March, they traveled to Kuban in order to unite with the Kuban Cossacks, most of whom did not support the volunteer army. In March, 3,000 men under the command of General Viktor Pokrovsky joined the volunteer army, increasing its membership to 6,000 and by June to 9,000. In 1919, the Don Cossacks joined the army. In that year, between May and October, the voluntary army, the volunteer army grew from 64,000 to 150,000 soldiers and was better supplied than the red than its red counterpart. The white army's white army's rank and file comprised active anti-Bolsheviks, such as Cossacks, nobles, and peasants, as conscripts and as volunteers. So what do we what do we under, what do you guys understand that to mean? Because I don't know that I understand 
exactly what the counter-revolution is because from what I was understanding is that the counter-revolution is to take down the government that they just put in place. But it's, when you go back to the Bolsheviks, it said that it was there were those that were sympathetic to Bolsheviks that were sympathetic to now what was in place. And they joined with some from the red, joined the white army and fought against Lenin then, right? Mm -hmm. but, they're, but they're still fighting against, they're still, both are still fighting against Trump or, Trump. or the lead. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. In both situations, the counter-revolution is fighting against Trump or, the, or his establishment. That's what it seems like I'm understanding is the counter-revolution is to take down Trump. Yeah, that's like in either story, even if the, the Reds join the White, they're still trying to take down whoever that leader is and establishing their own um, whatever. It's really interesting because when you have all that going on, God's got his own plan going on while they're doing all their thing and all their <laughs> battles. God's got his whole other plan going on at the same time. It makes me think of Esther, because when you think of how Haman was going about trying to secretly um, do his thing, uh -huh. and then God had already, you know, put Esther as queen, he was doing his He's thing. already got everything in yeah, place and, and in motion. Yep. Yeah, so as he's thinking that, oh, I'm going to get Mordecai, I'm going to get up, up, you didn't know that Queen Esther was Jewish, did you? So it was kind of <laughs> really, <laughs> it's kind of really interesting how um, God fought that, you know. Wow. Well, you guys keep the discussion. I'll be right back. We got 30 minutes or, yeah, I'll be right back. Okay. Sister Elaine, I think it's going to remain silent until you come back. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> um, Adriana, would you mind going over what we're doing next in the classes, the Bible study classes? I, I didn't totally get it. We're going to start Australia? Yeah. And, and when are we going to start those? Monday. This coming Monday? Yeah, so if you guys have a video that you want to present, let me know so I can put you on the list. Otherwise, we're going to end up having like terrible study nights because I'm, I, like, I'm so behind on so much stuff. I, I don't even know anymore. Okay. I'm really struggling this week. So are you saying Monday, um, November 4th? Yeah. And have you, it looks like you've already done the first one. Is that true? No. no? I see the transcripts up there on the website. That's not my like, computer. I thought the first one was where she was talking about FFA. Well, Brother Jonathan has that one done. <laughs> um, okay, Australia admin. So which one is he sent prophets, but they would not listen. Yeah, that's not the first one. So, so you've got that one done already. He sent prophets, but they would not give ear. I don't, I don't want to over. I don't want to do somebody else's that's already done. You know? Yeah, I have that one done. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that whatever they started to do immediately after the FFA split, that's where we're starting. So the FFA, the first, the last rebellion. Yes. Okay. Um, Brother Jonathan, do you want to do that one since you've got it done already? What day are you, what day would that be? Do you know? Uh, Monday, November 5th, uh, November 4th. This Monday? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could do it. It's all done. You've got, because you've got it done already. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a long one. So it probably wouldn't get all done in one night. I was going to ask the same thing. Is that the fall, the FFA and the fall? Yeah, because you did that the other night, right? Yeah, that was the second half, the second night it took me to finish cool. it. So he's ready to go for Monday if you're free. Good. Yay, I'm so happy. I was going to ask that. I was thinking that when I was in the bathroom. Because <laughs> I was going to ask that. You're so happy. Brother Jonathan, how many? That's the only place I can think anymore. I don't know okay, why. What did you say? How many days will that take you? Uh, one and a half or two days? Um, it'll if I yeah quiet. On how to do it because I did when I first did it I did one whole night and I got more than halfway through it but the second night I started back um, a bit to, uh -huh. to 
yeah, kind of because we're halfway through a, one of the lines. But if we don't do that, then I could do it on a night and a half. Okay. Some summaries are all good. So that would take care of next week because then Friday we have uh, the Zoom meeting, right? And the Zoom meeting includes a, pre a, pre a presentation, right? C correct? No, November, um, November 8th? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, November 8th will be part of our little mini camp meeting. Okay. And so if Jonathan takes the fourth and the sixth in his first presentation, then so for Friday. Excuse me? Then we don't need anything for Friday. Is that what you're right. saying? Correct. And so the next days would be for November 4th, presentation number two, correct? Yes. Are you taking number two? Um, I'm not sure which one is that one, uh, Adriana, that you did already. Um, he sent profits, but they would not list, did not, would not give you. I haven't, I haven't figured that out yet. Here's the order that they go in. FFA, the final rebellion. Then they had no part in the work. Then, oh, consistency, thou art a jewel. Then repeat and enlarge part one. Then repeat and enlarge part two. Then there's the Q&A. Then this is the way Waki ended by Parminder. Then the one that I transcribed, he sent prophets, but they would not give ear. So it's quite a ways. Okay, so that's number seven. Yeah. So the next one after John is going to be they had no part in the work. Okay. What, 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 does everybody else have the same dream that I do that I'd like to be do it, be able to participate and do every one of them? Yeah. <laughs> but there's, it's impossible to do it. I had this idea of no time. And I, I'm done. Too much noise, I can't hear. Who is doing the two um, repeat and enlarge ones out of you guys? No, nobody's picked any, but since I'm the biggest mouth, um, I'll, I'll take number two. They had no part in the work. Okay. <laughs> okay. If, uh, we, we, I think we decided last week um, that on the Sabbath, because in two weeks, well, actually probably three weeks, because uh, we have two more Brazil classes that we're going to switch over to the Portugal classes because there's details that she brings up in different, um, in different uh, places where she's been. So I don't know if I'm going to look at them to see how much of it we do or if we do do it all the way straight through like we did Brazil, or if we don't, and just pick up on some of the ones that have different information. It was the Portugal class, uh, the reform lines part one is the one that I did, but erased it. I only have three paragraphs of that. So I, that's what I was gonna do, because she was talking about going back to look at what Portugal said, and that's why I started there. Okay. So I'm gonna do that one. If you did. What? Mr. Adriana, what did you say? If you had saved the 10 pages and then once you deleted, you didn't save it, it would still be there. I looked, but there was, well, what happened was um, I was saving, but then I went to put a header on and it made the screen fuzzy. And then something came up and said, um, if you, um, whatever it is, you won't lose this. So I assumed I wouldn't lose it. But it oh, and but I saved it like three times too, and I looked in every file that I can to get it back, and only three are coming up everywhere I look. Only the three um, paragraphs, so I can't find it. I tried. Okay. I'm just not very good at it, but I'm learning. Did anybody see that um, New York Times article about Trump and Twitter? Yeah, I didn't get to read it. I um, just thought that you put it up there. Tony, did you leave your, your, was it, what are you doing it on Word? Yes, I was, yes. Have you closed it down since that happened? Yeah, uh, I'm not it? sure, I don't, I, maybe not. If it's still not. open, it might be, it might, you might be able to go back on recent saves. I don't know if, because you have that new, the new office and it might actually do that where you can go back on, where it may save your page at different stages. Okay. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll have my sister try to help me do that. 
Yeah, if not, then just leave it open. And then I, if she can't, um, maybe even tomorrow we can get on Zoom and I can, you can do a share screen and we can see if we can find it. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. And if anyone is doing repeat in a large one and two, I would like your transcript, please, when I redo it. <laughs> yeah, get, get all your guys' notes to both of us, like we usually yeah. do, so that we can get them on all the websites for, um, to share. I, I need to present that those next two, not for a little while, but I have to do those on Thursday night in the other groups. So. Oh, cool. I'll, I'll work do the book book. Because you can do what you do for one, you can just repeat with us. Yeah, that's what I'm doing with the with the first one. So, but the second one, if someone, because I, I won't have time to, I have to do the, the two repeat and enlarge videos and I'm going to do all the board work, but the transcript always takes me a long time. So if someone else is doing that in this group, then that would be great, and I can just take the transcript. Um, Christine said she was taking one of them. She's taking number two, so repeat and enlarge one, one and two are the, are the next two, I think. Um, the next one is, oh, consistency, thou art a jewel. Oh, you're right, and then repeat and enlarge are number four and five. Does anyone want to take that on? So really quick, um, I'm not going to include the Q&A videos, if that's all right. And okay. The ones that are here, I'm taking um, he sent profits, but they were not here, and Donald Trump, a man for his time, just because those are the two that I have transcribed. I only was in with the Donald Trump one, so that's nine. Um, but there's oh consistency, thou art a jewel, then the two repeated and largest, then the parmenter one, this is the way walking in it, and then the one I'm doing, then parmenter. Parmenter again, hit truth of the Jewish economy, and then Donald Trump, a man for his I could take two, I could take, I gotta do November 9th, and it's a three hour one, so, um, so after November 9th, give me some that, give me a couple, like, five days later, or five presentations later or something, and then, that, that would be number eight, just number eight. That's all? The Jewish economy, I'll put you down, and I'll tell you. And as we're do, thinking this through, keep in mind that the camp meeting is, when the camp meeting is going to start being posted, do you want to go through these ones first and then, or bump up ahead or just go? Through? Yeah, because I think they've been trying to set up the camp meeting with us. That's why I took the Q&As out because that would be too much extra that we don't need. Right. Um, and it's just nine. I feel like we'll go through them pretty quick. And, and what camp meeting, what camp meeting is this that they're doing now? The name of it? Australia? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I'm probably not going to transcribe or pin in largest because I'm going to start to try to transcribe whatever is coming out of the camp meeting. Sorry. It's my name. <laughs> I know what it is. <laughs> so are we going to have a list? Uh, Elena, are you going to post this list like you did last time and we can let you know what we want? Because if I have a visual, I'll know more of what I can do. Yeah, she'll post it on the SAC Fellowship page. Okay, great. And if she sends it to me, then I'll keep it like I did the Germany one down in the email. Yeah, I like to print it out. Yeah. Because I, I, I kind of keep the one in email updated as we went along. So, Brother Victor, I think I haven't heard you jump in to volunteer for any of these, and I know you want to do some. <laughs> and he used to transcribe all the time back in the day. I think he's trying to talk. Uh -huh. Sorry. I'm having my problems um i can do the o consistency one okay awesome thank you oh i didn't get my um um i'm sorry i didn't get my um the name of it on um, november 8th hidden truth of the jewish economy by parliament so that's on november 8th no it's num presentation number eight on the ethic. oh okay Woo. Okay. <laughs> no, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so everybody knows what they're doing next week then. I know what I'm doing on November 9th, that's all. Okay. So all I need now, one, two, three. Um, I have three videos that don't have. I have the two repeat and enlarges, and I have this is the way walking in it by Parminder. I'll do this, this is the way. Okay. You're already doing one. Um, I know, but don't you need more? Well, it's later, right? I could do it later after my November 9th. It's going to be right on top of your other one. And these yeah, um, 
the the this is the way is an hour and 48 minutes and then your next one um i don't know you, you can do that, but I'm yes just saying. you have two for november 9 plus one of one of these admin australia ones and then one more that would be within it's like not, a two-week period this, what do you mean i have two wait i'm confused that's why i need to see the list because i know that i'm doing a, a camp meeting for um the one i'm doing but um these aren't until after the camp meeting, correct? Correct. Yeah, and it's a ways the the he the which one was it? This is the way walk in it is a ways after the camp meeting, but then it's only one presentation after before you have to go again. Well, like I said, I could probably do that because that's a ways off. As long as I get through this number nine, it only takes me a day if I give it the whole day to make it. It only takes me six hours because I was you know to do one I just erased okay yeah. yeah so then we just have the two repeat and enlarge them well I could try one oh yeah. praise Woo! the lord which one do you want the first or the second I'll give you the first we've yeah. been waiting for that second is that Robert oh yeah is that Robert I thought yes yeah. I thought so hey, hey, brother okay repeat and enlarge I don't know Oh, I don't see. I mean, not Christine. Not, sorry. The I'm Lucas Christine. family isn't on here, but I know they might want to take one. Oh yeah. So can I reserve one for them? Yeah, and then we'll ask them. They'll, maybe they'll be on after um, in the course. afternoon. Yeah. If you want a practice session with anybody, yeah, a practice session. Do you know how to use the voice type? No. So we're going to talk to him during lunch. Maybe we'll go ahead and break now, but start back at our usual time. And um, we'll have to bring your laptop as soon as you can. Yeah, we're going to work with Robert to, to help her get, get started. So, um, praise the Lord. Unless anybody else has anything else they want to discuss before we break? I don't on. know, but I would like to say that um, you know that I got the Dragon Dictate. I know that I paid 99 for mine, but they do have some cheaper. Just, you know, in case anyone wants to know that. Google Docs, I've how, heard. How much was it? Um, I paid 99 for mine, and it's pretty accurate, but they have as much as, I think, 55 or something like that. It, it just does it itself? You don't have to do anything? No, you. what you do, it's the headset. You have to still read it in a microphone, but being that the microphone is close to your mouth, it gets you, and you can, you know, talk clearly, it, it automatically comes up, and you can put, you can say comma, new sentence, erase. It has a lot of different commands. Figures. You're listening and talking at the same time. That's I really struggled with that when I tried. Well, I'm not. I can't. Me too. I can't do that, especially when there's not a translator. So what I do is, um, if there's not a translator, and this is kind of hard because it depends who's talking. Parminder seems to be talking the clearest. That's why I chose him. Um, his so far, I haven't had too many problems of having to spell it out what he was trying to say. But um, yeah, I, I silence him and I look at the, the CC, the closed captions. So that's why sometimes it takes a while because you will have to stop. Oh, ah, that's a good that. Yeah. Okay. No, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'll try that. Okay. So much onion. Let's go ahead and uh, close in prayer. <laughs> Brother Robert, would you like to close in prayer and pray for the food? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for bringing us together today to study thy word. Bless this Sabbath day. Give us a double blessing for this on this day, Lord. And just want to thank you so much for all the participants that have here today. God protect us through this day, Lord. Help us keep it home. And we pray that the food might bless and strengthen our body. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we'll be back at two thirty. Parable started.